Aerodynamics Lesson 2.4 Performance and Maneuvering During this lesson we will discuss takeoff, cruise, and landing performances, propeller effects, turns, load factors, and stability. Terminal objectives remain the same from the previous three sections. Be sure to review your enabling objectives from the 2.4 chapter of your aerodynamics training guide. Takeoff and landing performance. Takeoff performance states that a takeoff is a transition of the weight of the airplane shifting from the wheels to the wings. Minimum takeoff speed is 20% above power op stall speed using the same stall speed equation from 2.3 a 20% buffer is added to the stall speed to allow for a safety margin to avoid stalls immediately after takeoff such as during an emergency As indicated stall speed is not changed with an increase in altitude, indicated takeoff speed will also not be affected by changes in density due to altitude, temperature, or humidity. Factors reducing takeoff speed. Decreasing weight, increasing wing surface area, and increasing CL max will all decrease the velocity and indicated airspeed required for takeoff. Increasing density will only decrease the velocity for takeoff. Things that will affect that density are lower elevation, lower temperature, and little to no humidity. Flaps reducing takeoff speed. Lowering flaps will increase the camber of the airfoil, thereby increasing CL max. This will cause a decrease in both takeoff velocity and takeoff indicated airspeed. Setting the T6 Bravo flaps to takeoff setting will allow a slower takeoff speed and also a lower CL max AOA. Landing flaps will increase the drag compared to takeoff flaps, thereby decreasing your acceleration down the runway. Forces affecting an airplane during takeoff and landing. The four main forces of flight, thrust, weight, lift, and drag, are always acting on the airplane. But as long as the airplane is in contact with the ground, a fifth force of rolling friction will affect the airplane. Rolling friction is found using the equation to the right. The coefficient of rolling friction is determined by four things. Runway surface, runway condition, tire type, and degree of braking application. That coefficient will affect how much rolling friction there is acting on the tires of the airplane. Typical materials used for runway surface include concrete, grass, non-skid, asphalt, and dirt. Depending on the surface that you are taking off from, it will have differing coefficients of rolling friction which will change the overall force of friction on the tires. Runway condition will also affect the coefficient of rolling friction. Runway surface conditions that affect the coefficient of rolling friction include wet runways, 
icy runways, hot runways, or worn down runways. Tire type includes the tread pattern and condition, how worn the tires are, new tires versus old tires, and overinflated versus underinflated tires. All of these will affect your coefficient of rolling friction. Finally, degree of braking application. During takeoff, brake effects should be zero. You don't want to be wasting your brakes during your takeoff roll. Also, it will decrease your net acceleration force. Minimum takeoff distance. The primary factors affecting takeoff performance are weight and the net accelerating force found by taking thrust and subtracting from it drag and rolling friction. As you can see in the equation, the distance for takeoff is found by, taking, by squaring the weight and dividing by the acceleration of gravity, air density, surface area, CL max, thrust, drag, and rolling friction. Factors affecting takeoff distance. Weight, as is already stated, is going to be the most mo have the most effect on your takeoff distance due to the fact that an increase in weight will require an increase in lift. Not only will it increase not only will the weight be increased on top, an increase in weight will also increase your rolling friction and the net accelerating force, thereby decreasing your net accelerating force. Air density. Decreasing air density is equivalent to increasing the density altitude. This will increase takeoff velocity required, has no effect on your indicated airspeed for takeoff, but since your velocity is increased, your ground speed will be increased, which overall will increase your takeoff distance. Factors that decrease air density include higher elevations, higher outside air temperatures, and higher relative humidity. The 4H club is a combination of heavy aircraft, which was already, already discussed, and the three things affecting density, high altitude, high temperatures, and high humidity. If any of these are present during your pre-flight calculations, expect your takeoff performance to be decreased. Flaps overall reduce the takeoff distance. Lowering flaps will increase camber and CL max. Setting the flaps to takeoff allows shorter takeoff distances. Takeoff flaps increase the camber while not increasing the drag as much as landing flaps.
Winds do not affect the required takeoff velocity or indicated airspeed. The plane still requires the same amount of wind over its wings to generate lift. However, a headwind will decrease ground speed. And with that decrease in ground speed, takeoff distance will decrease as well. Since the aircraft will have a positive true airspeed before beginning its takeoff roll, it will not need to accelerate for as long. Less distance is therefore required to obtain the remaining true airspeed necessary to generate sufficient lift for takeoff. After the wheels leave the ground, the airplane will begin its climb. We need to understand max climb performances based on max angle of climb and max rate of climb. These two constant velocities allow the plane to climb in equilibrium based on these two maximum performances. Both of these performances are found using maximum power and are dependent on maximum thrust excess and maximum power excess. Maximum angle of climb. Maximum angle of climb is found by getting the maximum altitude while minimizing distance traveled over the ground. This is used for obstacle clearance. To achieve maximum angle of climb, pilot shall set full throttle to achieve maximum thrust excess. Using maximum thrust excess, the aircraft can climb at a steeper angle. Remembering our curves from arrow 1, we find our maximum thrust excess for a turboprop aircraft to the left of LD Max, meaning a lower airspeed and higher angle of attack. Maximum rate of climb. This is achieved by gaining the maximum altitude over time. Or in other words, the maximum vertical velocity. This is used to reach a required altitude in the shortest amount of time. Or in other words, an expedited climb. To achieve maximum rate of climb, Full throttle must be used, and the pilot must fly the airplane to the maximum power excess. This is found in a turboprop aircraft at LD Max angle of attack. For the T6, maximum angle LD Max angle of attack is 4.4 units. While flying in the T6, you will not be required to know the difference between your best angle of climb and best rate of climb. By flying the best rate of climb, or best climb, you will be able to clear all obstacles. Maximum angle of climb is also clo too close to the stalling angle of attack for students. In the T6, you will fly LD Max airspeed and AOA, which is approximately 140 knots and 4.4 units angle of attack. Factors affecting climb performance outside air temperature, weight, altitude, configuration, and wind will all be discussed. An increase in outside air temperature decreases air density. Redu reduced air density causes thrust and power available to decrease, thus causing a decrease in thrust and power excess. Angle of climb and rate of climb performance will decrease. An increase in weight reduces thrust excess and power excess, thereby 
reducing maximum angle of climb and rate of climb performance. Along with the decrease in performance, the airplane will have to increase maximum angle of climb airspeed and maximum rate of climb airspeed to attain the maximum power and thrust excess. An increase in altitude reduces the thrust excess and power excess, thereby reducing maximum angle of climb and rate of climb performance. Airspeed required to fly will also increase due to the decrease in density the airplane will have to have a higher true airspeed or velocity through the air to maintain the same amount of lift. Landing gear. Lowering the landing gear will increase the drag causing a decrease in thrust and power excess. It will not affect the airspeed needed to fly, but it will increase the power and thrust required to attain that airspeed, thereby decreasing your thrust and power excess and decreasing your maximum angle of climb and rate of climb performance. Flaps will increase the drag, however decrease the airspeed at which the airplane needs to fly. By increasing the camber, the airplane can fly at a lower airspeed and maintain the same amount of lift. However, this increases the overall drag on the airfoil, causing the thrust and power required curves to shift up and to the left. Thrust excess and power excess will both decrease, causing maximum angle of climb and rate of climb performance to decrease as well. Wind effects on maximum angle of climb and rate of climb. Rate of climb performance is not affected by wind. The vertical velocity of the airplane will not be affected if you are flying at your LD max angle of attack and velocity. The angle of climb will be increased, but the rate at which you are climbing will remain constant. A headwind increases maximum angle of climb performance because with a headwind, ground speed is decreased. Ground speed is decreased for the same forward true airspeed. The airplane will be able to climb at a high, steeper angle. Conversely, a tailwind will decrease maximum angle of climb performance by increasing the ground speed. When discussing climbs, we must always take account of the power available and the power excess. While climbing at your maximum rate of climb, your power available will decrease as well as your power required will increase. The first ceiling that you will hit is your combat ceiling. This will be found when your power excess only allows the airplane to climb at 500 foot per minute. As you continue to climb, your power available reduces and your power required increases, causing you to only be able to maintain a 300 foot per minute rate of climb at your cruise ceiling. Service ceiling is found when your power excess only allows you to climb at 100 foot per minute. The absolute ceiling is found when the power required and power available curves are tangent at LD max angle of attack and velocity. This is the highest altitude that a plane can 
maintain airspeed and altitude. The maximum operating ceiling of the T6 Bravo does not have anything to do with the altitude ceilings. Altitude ceilings are only dependent on your power available and your power required and will change day to day. Your maximum operational ceiling is 31,000 feet MSL. This is due to FAA restrictions on the airframe of the T6. Do not confuse this with altitude ceilings above. Transitioning from the climb to our maximum endurance and maximum range profiles, we need to shift our performance characterization from worrying about climb performance to worrying about fuel burn performance. As fuel flow is a rate, pounds per hour, gallons per hour, liters per hour, all of the cruise performance profiles will be found on the power curve, as power is the rate of doing work. Maximum endurance is the maximum time airborne for a given amount of fuel. Maximum endurance occurs at the minimum fuel flow. For the T6, this occurs at 8.8 .8 units angle of attack. For propeller airplanes, minimum fuel flow is the bottom of the power required curve. This is a velocity less than LD max and an angle of attack greater than LD max. Maximum range for a no wind situation is found for the, by the maximum distance traveled for a given amount of fuel. The slope of a line drawn from the origin and lying tangent to the power required curve gives us the amount of distance that we are going over the amount of fuel that is being used, or basically our fuel per distance efficiency. Maximum range occurs where the line is tangent to the power required curve, which as we learned from arrow one is LD max, which for the T6 is 4.4 units angle of attack. Changes to maximum endurance and maximum range profiles. We will look at weight, altitude, configuration, and wind. Weight affects performance profiles for maximum endurance and maximum range because an increase in weight increases the velocity at which you need to fly along with the drag that is produced by the increased lift required. This will increase your required fuel flow and thereby decrease both your maximum range and maximum endurance performance. Altitude effects on performance profiles. Increasing altitude will cause a decrease in engine inlet temperatures. This decrease in temperatures causes a decrease in fuel flow. Due to the increase in altitude, the fuel will become more efficient due to colder temperatures. Your power lever will increase Your airspeed required to fly will increase. However, 
it will still decrease your fuel flow requirement, thereby increasing your amount of time in the air and the amount of distance that you can do go, increasing your overall performance. By lowering the landing gear, we will increase drag. Increase drag increases power required, which is going to increase your fuel, fuel flow and thereby increasing your overall endurance and range performance. There is no change to the velocity that you need to fly. Flaps, however, do affect our wings causing our power required curve to move up and to the left. This, will, this is caused by an increase in drag, which will increase the power required, increasing the fuel flow required. While it decreases the velocity required to fly in equilibrium, it will overall decrease my range and endurance performance. If I'm going for range or going for endurance, I do not want my flaps to be down. Wind effect on performance profiles. Wind has no effect on maximum endurance. Endurance is only concerned with time airborne. Since we are not concerned with ground travel, wind has no effect on that maximum endurance. However, as soon as I am worried about distance over the ground with range, I need to account for winds. The line that we looked at before that was tangent and started at the origin gave us our maximum range for a no wind situation. As soon as I have a tailwind, I will be getting a higher ground speed. This will increase my range on its own, but if I want to increase my range even further, I can take advantage of the increased ground speed and decrease the power setting and decrease the velocity at which I'm flying. Since the air mass is already moving, my airplane doesn't need to travel nearly as fast through that air mass to get the same amount of distance over the ground at a reduced fuel consumption. In other words, reducing power required decreases the true airspeed for maximum range, which allows me to reduce my fuel flow and increase my maximum range performance. Think about how you would want to act if you, ha if you were running with a tailwind. You would want to sail to harness that wind and allow yourself to move faster over the ground. Your plane is the same way. You will go to a lower true airspeed while presenting a higher surface area, higher angle of attack, and allow that wind to push you further downwind. Conversely, a headwind will decrease my ground speed. Again, this will have no effect on my endurance. It will absolutely affect my range. As we move that tangent line back for a tailwind, we have to move the origin point forward for a headwind to account for the difference in ground speed to velocity. As we move that origin point further to the right, causes our power required to increase. I need to fly a higher true airspeed to overcome that reduction in ground speed due to the headwind. Because of this, I will increase my fuel flow and overall decrease my maximum range performance. This shift is required to reduce the effects of that headwind. Overall it will still reduce your performance, 
But if I fly faster at a lower angle of attack, I will be driving through that headwind and it will affect my range slightly less than if I were to maintain at LD max angle of attack and velocity. Glide performance. Glide performance is dependent on lift to drag ratio in equilibrium flight. It is determined by thrust and power deficits. This is where we will find our maximum glide range and maximum glide endurance. Maximum glide range is the maximum distance traveled over the ground in a glide. It will also be the minimum angle of descent. Since it is an angle, it will be found at my minimum thrust deficit. Minimum thrust deficit for a turboprop aircraft will be found, for any aircraft, will be found at LD max angle of attack and velocity, the bottom of my thrust required curve. Maximum glide endurance is the maximum time airborne, also known as the minimum rate of descent. Since it is a rate, it will be found at my minimum power deficit. Maximum glide endurance is found at my minimum power deficit, which is found at an angle of attack greater than LD max and a velocity less than LD max. For the T6 Bravo, this occurs at 8.8 .8 units angle of attack. Best glide speed is the power off airspeed, which provides maximum range at LD max. When you do simulated and actual engine loss in a T6, you will fly your V best glide, which is 125 knots. Best glide speeds vary based on weight, but in the T6, the variation is minimal. T6 Bravo best glide speed in a clean configuration, meaning gear ups and flaps up and speed break in, is 125 knots. For the T6, the best glide speed produces an 11 to 1 glide ratio. For every 1,000 feet of altitude loss, the T6 can glide 11,000 feet across the ground. Since one nautical mile is 6,000 feet, the T6 can glide nearly two nautical miles for every 1,000 foot of altitude loss. Remember that the pilot glides to arrive overhead the airfield at 2,500 feet AGL. Factors affecting glide performance. We will discuss weight, altitude, wind, configuration, and propeller feathering. As weight increases, LD max AOA remains the same. However, LD max velocity increases. Glide range is dependent only on AOA. Range does not change with a weight increase. The plane will fall faster, but with it falling faster, will have a higher horizontal range, horizontal velocity. Thus, a heavier plane will have the same glide performance as a lighter plane. Glide endurance, velocity increases with weight. Along with this, descent rate will increase. When the rate of descent increases, due to the increase in velocity, glide endurance performance will decrease. Altitude on glide performance. The higher you are, the farther and longer you can glide. Due to this, 
both max glide endurance and max glide range will increase. Effects of wind on glide performance. Glide endurance is only concerned with the time airborne, not distance traveled. Due to this, wind has no effect on maximum glide endurance. Glide range is dependent on ground distance traveled. Tailwinds will increase glide range by increasing the ground speed. Conversely, headwinds will decrease glide range by decreasing ground speed. Effects of configuration on glide performance. Drag caused by configuration changes will reduce both glide endurance and range performance. Clean configuration minimizes total drag and allows you to glide farther for longer. A windmilling unfeathered prop increases sink rate significantly. As you see in the chart, in a clean configuration, your best glide speed is 125 knots with a 1350 foot per minute rate of descent. Glide ratio is 2 to every 1,000 feet, 2 nautical miles to every 1,000 feet. Lowering your gear will increase your drag index to 20. Best glide speed will decrease to 105 knots, and sink rate will increase to 1,500 foot per minute, reducing your glide ratio by, ha uh, by 25%. Flaps and gear down will cause your drag index to increase to 80, decreasing your best glide speed to 95, and increasing your sink rate to 1800 foot per minute. Overall, this will decrease your clean configuration drag profile glide ratio by half. In a clean configuration, if your propeller does not feather, your best glide speed will be 110 knots your sink rate will increase to 2,350 foot per minute, and your glide ratio will be cut in half prior to extending landing gear or flaps. The T6 Bravo propeller is a variable pitch, constant speed propeller. This means that the pitch of the propeller changes as you demand more or less thrust from the engine. If the engine dies and the propeller stays in the driving configuration, which you see here, the wind coming through the propeller will start to backdrive the propeller and thereby backdriving the engine. This is what is known as a windmilling prop. As you saw in the graph prior, this will increase your drag and overall increase your sink rate even in a clean configuration, decreasing your glide range by half. During an engine off scenario, you must be sure to pull the PCL completely off to allow the propeller to feather. In other words, align the propellers into the relative wind. This will give you your minimum drag from your propeller and stop your propeller from windmilling. Region of Reverse Command Increased power for decreasing speed In a turboprop airplane, if you want to fly slower than your maximum endurance in level flight, you must increase power. Remember that maximum endurance is the minimum power required for a turboprop aircraft. This increase in power overcomes the increase in induced drag and total drag in order to achieve slower airspeeds and higher angles of attack while maintaining level flight. Remember your slow flight from IFS. Region of Normal Command. In a turboprop airplane, if you want to fly faster than maximum endurance, you must increase power. 
this increase in power overcomes an increase in parasite drag in order to achieve faster air speeds. Landing performance. A landing is the opposite of a takeoff. Transition of the weight of the airplane shifting it from the wings back to the wheels. Minimum landing speed or landing velocity is 30% above power off stall speed. The 30% safety margin is to avoid stall during the approach to land, which is also when the aircraft would be at a lower power setting. Indicated landing speed uses sea level density standard day. Factors reducing landing speed. Decreasing weight, increasing wing surface area, and increasing CL max. Just like they did with takeoff velocity and indicated airspeed, will decrease your landing velocity and indicated airspeed. Increasing density will decrease landing velocity only. Lower elevation, lower temperature, and little to no humidity will all decrease your landing velocity while not affecting your indicated airspeed. Lowering flaps increases camber and CL max. Setting the T6 flaps to landing during the approach allows a slower approach airspeed and a lower CL max AOA. Drag increases with the use of flaps in the landing setting, which is useful on landing due to the increase in your net deceleration force. Landing forces. Just like with takeoff, thrust, weight, lift, and drag all apply to the aircraft. And as soon as you contact the runway, rolling friction comes back into play. Remember the four things that affect your coefficient of rolling friction are the runway type, runway condition, tire type, and braking application. Landing distance. The formula to the right shows the variables involved in calculating the landing distance. Primary forces are weight and the net decelerating force. This equation should look familiar. It is the same equation as your takeoff distance equation. However, the net accelerating force has been rearranged to now favor rolling friction and drag instead of thrust. The same factors that affected our takeoff distance are going to affect our landing distance. Added weight increases the landing velocity, also increases the indicated airspeed, which will increase your ground speed upon landing. The increased ground speed will require a longer distance to dissipate as you decelerate. Air density. Decreasing air density is equivalent to increasing the density altitude. This increases landing velocity. While it has no effect on indicated airspeed, it will increase your true airspeed, which
which causes an increase in landing distance. Factors decreasing air density will include higher elevation, higher outside air temperature, and higher relative humidity. Winds do not affect the landing velocity or indicated airspeed for landing. A headwind will decrease your ground speed and shorten the landing distance, while a tailwind will increase ground speed and lengthen landing distance. Landings are normally performed into the wind. Flaps reducing landing distance. Lowering flaps increases camber and sail max. Setting the flaps to landing during approach allows a shorter landing distance. Hold the tail off. In this video, you will know okay, now he's got a side slip it under the roof. Of the you can see out the side windows what's happening here. That nose is so high, you can't see over it. He can't just fly it straight down. So he's flying somewhat blind. Okay, he's looking out there. He's got it. He's got the main gear on it. Now he's got to drive forward. Right into the corner. Land it. See, you gotta hold that tail up because the wind will help fly if you bring that tail down. The rush, you gotta slow down very carefully. You cannot hit the brakes or Ken goes into a nosedive real fast. So Ken Peach and that interstate cadet landing on the world's shortest runway moving 60 miles an hour under you. That's pretty darn good. There goes the Yak 18, there goes the Yak 55. Look at that simultaneous rose on takeoff. Look at these flying airplanes that he was a small child when his mother surprised the family. Decelerating techniques. There are two basic decelerating techniques aerodynamic braking. And mechanical braking. Or beta. Aerodynamic braking is most effective during the high speed part of the landing roll. Maintain a constant pitch attitude to increase the equivalent parasite area. This braking action requires longer runway distances, and it is important that the nose wheel comes into contact with the runway prior to the rudder losing effectiveness. If the nose wheel is not in contact with the ground prior to losing rudder effectiveness, the airplane will weather vane into the relative wind and possibly cause the airplane to depart the runway surface. Mechanical braking involves increasing rolling friction. However, care must be taken to make sure that you don't get hot brakes. This is most effective towards the end of the landing roll, when all wheels must be in contact with the runway and you are bleeding off the last bit of speed. If you brake too hard, your brakes will start on fire. Crosswind landings. Nose wheel lift off touchdown speed. The rudder is the primary control surface to maintain directional control. During a crosswind landing, the wings will be deflected down towards the relative wind, and the rudder will be used to maintain directional control across the runway. At low speeds, the rudder is not effective due to reduced airflow velocity. Thus, the nose wheel must be used to maintain directional control at low speeds and must be in contact with the ground prior to losing rudder effectiveness. Crosswind limits for the T6. Maximum crosswind limits are based on the ability to maintain directional control. Max crosswind for a dry runway is 10 knots flaps landing, 25 knots with the flaps in the takeoff or up position, and this may be reduced even further by local SOP. Max crosswind for a wet runway are, is 10 knots. Hydroplaning and factors that affect hydroplane speed. 
Hydroplaning occurs when the tires skim on top of the water on the runway. This can occur on a layer as thin as one-tenth of an inch. As the plane loses contact with the runway surface and skims across the water, it loses braking effectiveness and directional control. Hydroplane speed depends solely on tire pressure as is seen in the equation below. At the hydroplaning speed, there is a layer of water between the tire and the ground. T6 Bravo's main gear tire pressure is 225 psi, which results in a hydroplaning speed of 115 knots indicated airspeed. Landing with all flap configurations at recommended landing speeds will keep you below the hydroplaning speed of 115 knots. Other things you can do to reduce your likelihood of hydroplaning are touching down more firmly and using rudder for directional control. If brakes are used, gently pump the brakes to keep the wheels from locking up. Propeller. The T6 has a constant speed variable pitch propeller which spins at 2000 RPM. The engine and propeller spin clockwise when seen from the cockpit. Due to the clockwise spinning of the propeller and the pitch of the blades, the T6 will have a few left turning tendencies which will now be discussed. Torque. Torque is a reactive force based on Newton's third law of motion. Since the engine turns the propeller clockwise, an opposing force, cause, an opposing force causes the fuselage to torque or roll counterclockwise. To compensate for this, the T6 uses rudder and an automatic trim aid device. Second left turning tendency is P factor. Now P factor can be a right and left turning tendency depending on what phase of flight you are in. P factor is the yawing moment caused by one propeller blade creating more thrust than its opposing blade. If the free airstream relative wind is above the thrust line, the upgoing blade on the left side creates more thrust since it has a higher angle of attack, as is seen in the depiction to the right. Since the left side has more thrust, the nose will yaw to the right. Left rudder is required to maintain balanced flight at high speed flight. Conversely at low speed flight, when the relative wind is below the thrust line, the downgoing blade on the right side will produce more thrust. Since the right side has more thrust, the nose will yaw to the left, and the pilot must apply right rudder. For P factor to be noticeable, the engine must be at a high power setting, and the thrust axis must be displaced from the relative wind. The next left turning tendency is slipstream swirl. Slipstream swirl is a corkscrewing airflow that travels around the fuselage. This airflow impacts the left side of the vertical stabilizer, causing the nose to yaw left. 
slipstream swirl is greatest at low air speeds and high power settings. Right rudder must be used to compensate for the yaw. The last turning tendency is gyroscopic progression. When a force is applied to the rim of a spinning object, i.e. the propeller, parallel to the axis of rotation, being the thrust line, that force will be applied 90 degrees ahead of the direction of rotation, as is shown into the, in the picture to the right. By tilting the disc down, a force is applied parallel to the axis of rotation on the top of the spinning disc. That force is processed 90 degrees ahead in the direction of rotation and applies a force pushing on the right side of that spinning disc. Applying backstick pressure and pitching the nose up will cause the aircraft to yaw right. Applying forward stick pressure and pitching the nose down will cause the aircraft to yaw left. In the T6, this is compensated for using trim aid device. A review of all turning tendencies in the T6. Torque uses differential trim, including ailerons, and rudder. P factor, right rudder is used at slow airspeeds, left rudder is used at higher airspeeds. Slipstream swirl, right rudder is used to correct slipstream swirl, especially at low airspeeds and high power settings, like during a takeoff. Gyroscopic progression, procession is always evident anytime you have a spinning mass, being the propeller. To lessen the impact of gyroscopic progression, avoid abrupt control inputs, load factor. Load factor, denoted by a lowercase n, is the ratio of total lift divided by weight. It is also called G. During level unaccelerated flight, an airplane feels 1G. As angle of bank increases and total lift increases, load fi factor will also increase. Accelerated stalls. An accelerated stall is a stall that occurs at velocities greater than minimum straight and level stall speed and load factors greater than 1g. The equation at the bottom of the page should look similar to lesson 2.3. During lesson 2.3 we were looking at straight and level flight and therefore the load factor was 1. Now that we are starting to get into maneuvering flight we need to incorporate that load factor into our stall speed equation and as we pull more and more G our stall speeds will increase. Load factor and angle of bank. As angle of bank is increased the amount of G required to maintain level flight increases. As you start pulling more and more angle of bank, your lift vector tilts further towards the inside of the turn and provides less vertical component of lift. At 30 degrees angle of bank, your load factor needs to be 1.2. 45 degrees angle of bank, 1.4. 60 degrees angle of bank, 2. 80 degrees angle of bank, 5.7, and finally 90 degrees angle of bank, at which time your lift vector is 
per parallel to the ground and has no vertical component. Lift and turns. During a turn, the lift vector is divided into two components. The horizontal component, pulling you to the inside of the turn, and the vertical component, maintaining the aircraft in flight. The vertical component is the only part of lift that opposes weight. To compensate for a reduction of vertical component of lift, the pilot must increase backstick pressure, and due to an increase in drag caused by the increase in lift, the pilot must add power to maintain constant velocity. In a constant airspeed level turn, the pilot must maintain a constant vertical lift by increasing angle of attack to increase the total lift. By increasing that lift, you will increase drag, which requires a higher throttle setting to increase the thrust. Turn radius and turn rate. Turn performance is measured by two factors. Turn radius, the radius of the circle that the flight path defines, and turn rate, being the rate of heading change in degrees per second. Turn rate and radius are a factor of velocity and angle of bank. Maximum turn rate and minimum turn radius is achieved at maximum angle of bank, minimum velocity. If velocity is held constant and angle of bank is increased, the turn rate will increase, again being the amount of degrees per second, and turn radius will decrease. If angle of bank is held constant and airspeed is increased, the turn radius will increase and the turn rate will decrease. Weight does not directly affect turn performance as it is not in the turn performance equation. However, a heavier airplane requires more lift and therefore must fly at higher airspeeds. Higher airspeeds result in an increased turn radius and decreased turn rate. But the velocity is the part that actually increases the turn radius and decreases the turn rate, not the weight. Standard rate turn. In instrument flight, turns are made at a standard rate. Standard rate turns are 3 degrees per second. A 360 degree turn takes 120 seconds or 2 minutes. A standard rate turn is achieved when the turn needle is at two needle width deflection. To ballpark the angle of bank that is required for a standard rate turn, take 15 to 20 percent of your airspeed and that is the ballpark of the angle of bank required to keep you at a standard rate turn. For example, if you are going 100 knots, you will require a 15 to 20 degree angle of bank to maintain a standard rate turn. For 200 knots, you would require 30 to 40 degrees angle of bank to maintain that standard rate turn. Coordinated turns. The side slip indicator or balance ball provides a visual indication of coordinated flight. During a turn, the appropriate amount of rudder pressure must be applied 
in the direction of the turn in order to be in coordinated or balanced flight. A rule of thumb is to step on the ball to bring the airplane into balanced flight. Uncoordinated turns. If the forces acting on an airplane are not in balance, the airplane is in uncoordinated flight. There are two types of uncoordinated flight. Slips and skids. Slips. A slip results from insufficient rudder in the direction of turn. The nose of the airplane yaws to the outside of the turn, which will cause turn radius to increase and turn rate to decrease. A slip may be used to increase rate of descent or to compensate for wind during a crosswind landing. Skids are a result of excessive rudder in the direction of turn. The nose of the airplane yaws to the inside of the turn, which will cause turn radius to decrease while turn rate increases. A skid is a is dangerous because of the possibility of entering a skidded turn stall in which the fuselage blocks all good air from the inside wing, causing the inside wing to stall while the outside wing continues flying. Maneuvering increases both stall speed and load factor required for level flight. The graph below shows the amount of increase in both load factor required to maintain level flight and with that increased load factor the subsequent increased percentage in stall speed higher angle of bank requires higher G loading to maintain level flight in the T6 stall speed chart at the right uses weight, flap configuration, and angle of bank to determine what the new stall speed will be. The following video shows what can happen if a pilot forgets they require a vertical component of lift to maintain level flight. As the B-52 rolls into a high angle of bank turn, the lift vector is positioned more and more horizontal to the ground, and we can see the 52 starting to descend. The only fix for this is a decrease in angle of bank. If angle of bank is increased, now the lift vector is pointed down towards the ground, and the airplane quickly follows. Structural strength and failure definitions. Limit load factor. Limit load is the maximum load factor that can be sustained without risk of permanent deformation. The limit load is the maximum load anticipated in normal operation of the airplane. It is found in the aircraft's new tops manual. If force is increased past the limit load, that piece is now in an overstress condition. An overstress is the condition of possible permanent deformation or damage that results from exceeding the limit load. We must always report an overstress. If forces continue to increase, the next limit reached will be the elastic limit. This is the limit, which is the maximum load that can be placed on a material without permanent deformation. The material will bend, but when the load is removed, the material will return to its original unstressed shape. The ultimate load is the maximum load factor that the airplane can withstand without structural failure. The ultimate load is 1.5 times the limit load. 
he's got three knots and he's got 4,000 feet to go. 87. And the wings come. She's gonna go, she's gonna go. Holy cow, look at that. Come on, Jim. Get it up. Woo! Withstand the load of lift as those wings flex to support the weight of the aircraft. Static strength and static failure. Static strength is a measure of a material's resistance to single application of a steadily increasing load or force. Static failure is the breaking or major permanent deformation of that material due to that single application of a steadily increasing load or force. Fatigue strength versus fatigue failure. As opposed to static strength and static failure, fatigue strength is a measure of a material's resistance to a cyclic application of forces. Fatigue failure is the breaking or major permanent deformation of the material due to that cyclic application of force. To combat fatigue strength and fatigue failure ultimately in naval aircraft, all components on your naval aircraft will have a service life, which is the number of load or stress applications that a component can withstand prior to, prior to its failure point. If this is not adhered to, bad things can happen. Safe flight envelope. The VN diagram. The horizontal axis depicts indicated airspeed, and the vertical axis depicts load factor. As you can see across the bottom, indicated airspeed in knots, and load factor in Gs. Inside the safe flight envelope are the accelerated stall lines. The accelerated stall lines are the boundary between normal flight and stall. The accelerated stall lines represent the load factor at seal max AOA at various indicated airspeeds. These are often referred to as lines of maximum lift. Because if I try to pull more than 2 G's at 125 knots, my airplane will stall. It is also an advantageous zone because inside of this zone I will not be able to overstress my aircraft. Maneuvering point or speed. The maneuvering point is the intersection of the accelerated stall line and the positive limit load line. Below this airspeed no combination of maneuver or gust can overstress an airplane. The T6 maneuver speed is 227 knots. Redline airspeed is based on these basic factors. Critical Mach number, airframe temperature, structural limits, or controllability limits. Other names for the redline airspeed are limit airspeed or velocity never to exceed VNE. The redline in the T6 is 316 knots or 0.67 Mach, whichever is less.
Now let's get into a discussion of Mach number. Mach number is the ratio of an airplane's true airspeed to the local speed of sound. As an airplane holds a constant indicated airspeed during a climb, true airspeed will increase due to a decrease in density and local speed of sound will decrease due to the decreased temperature. Thereby, as altitude increases at a constant indicated airspeed, Mach number will increase. M crit or critical Mach number is the free airstream Mach number that produces the first evidence of local sonic flow. Since airplanes accelerate airflow to create lift, some local airflow is traveling faster than the airplane itself. The fastest local airflow is normally around surfaces that have the most curvature, like the canopy or wing. Due to this acceleration of airflow over an airplane surfaces, local velocities can be greater than sonic speeds prior to the airplane being supersonic speeds. Limit load and ultimate load lines. The positive and negative limit load lines represents the aircraft's structural limits. The negative limit load is less than the positive limit load for physiological reasons. Your body can't take negative three and a half G's, so why would they build the airplane to take more than negative three and a half G's? The T6 limit load factor is positive seven and negative 3.5. The ultimate load, not shown on this graph, will be 1.5 times the limit load. Aeroelastic effects. Caused by an internal moment that develops about the aerodynamic center of the wing. Aeroelastic effects are wing flutter, aileron reversal, and wing divergence. Wing flutter is an oscillatory motion of the wing that occurs when the moment about the aerodynamic center of the wing deflects the wing and then releases it. This can be uncomfortable in an actual airplane. Aileron reversal. The high dynamic pressure acting on a deflected aileron can cause the wing to twist if the wing's structural strength is not enough to withstand that load. This twisting moment will change the angle of incidence and thus change the lift created. The resulting lift change will roll the airplane in the opposite direction of the control input. In this video, the left aileron goes up and right aileron goes down as if the plane were trying to do a left aileron roll. As the ailerons are deflected, the wings twist and cause the airplane to roll to the right when controls were put in for the plane to roll to the left. Wing divergence. During flight at speeds above redline airspeed, the moment around right the on. dynamic center Yeah! yeah. Oh, sh He just crashed! Let's go, Terry. Let's go, let's go. Let's go to the truck. Come on. The to go up like this. The wing blew off and went like that. It tweaked just... ...fatigue failure from wing flutter.
factors affecting the VN diagram. Gross weight, altitude, configuration, asymmetric loading, and gust loading will all be studied to determine their effects on our VN diagram. Increasing weight will cause limit load and ultimate load to decrease. This causes the accelerated stall region to increase. Altitude. An increase in altitude will reduce the redline airspeed, but will not affect any limit or ultimate loads. For the T6, the redline airspeed is Mach 0.67 or 316 knots. Above around 19,000 feet MSL, your gaze will have to switch from indicated airspeed to Mach number as the redline airspeed starts to decrease. Configuration. Configuration changes may greatly affect every parameter of the, of the safe flight envelope. Gear down decreases your VNE to 150 knots and decreases your, G, your limit loads to positive 2.5 and 0. Flaps extension will also cause the stall speeds or accelerated stall lines to change. Asymmetric loading. Asymmetric loading is an uneven production of lift between the wings. This can be caused doing a rolling pullout, maintaining hung ordnance, or having trapped fuel. To prevent overstress during asymmetric loading, the pilot must decrease the limit load by one third. For the T6, it is simplified even further. In an asymmetric loading scenario, your limit load is decreased to positive 4.7 to negative one. Gust loading is caused when lift changes associated with gusts or turbulence can overstress the airplane without control input from the pilot. This is why in turbulent air, limit loads must be reduced by one third. Along with that, a NATOPS limit imposed on the T6 is a maximum airspeed of 207 knots in turbulent air. The maximum recommended airspeed is 180 knots. Both of these backing off from your maneuver speed to maintain in an area in which you will stall the airplane prior to overstressing it. Stability. Stability is the tendency of an object to return to equilibrium state once disturbed from it. Static stability is the initial tendency to move toward or away from equilibrium. Dynamic stability measures the displacement with respect to time. As static stability is all about the initial tendency, we can see that this ball is a, has positive static stability in which the initial tendency of the object is to return to its normal equilibrium position. Negative static stability is an initial tendency of an object to move away from its equilibrium position. And finally, neutral static stability is an initial tendency of an object to accept the new position as a new equilibrium position. Dynamic stability is what happens to the object over time. 
will the object ever reach equilibrium position over time, or will it diverge further and further from its equilibrium? To examine dynamic stability, we must first assume positive static stability. An object has to have an initial tendency towards its equilibrium point for dynamic stability to even be discussed. Negative static and neutral static ensure negative dynamic stability. Positive dynamic stability assumes positive static stability and has a dampened oscillation. Over time, that object returns to its equilibrium. Conversely, negative static stability, negative dynamic stability assumes again positive static stability. The initial tendency is towards equilibrium. However, over time, that object has a divergent oscillation. Neutral dynamic stability, again, assumes positive static stability with that initial tendency towards equilibrium. However, the oscillation is undamped over time. The object will never return to equilibrium. It will continually, perpetually move through equilibrium and find the same displacement to either side. Now that we understand stable and unstable conditions, both in static and dynamic, we can understand what makes an object stable and what makes an ob object unstable. A stable object will return to equilibrium. A stable object must have positive static and positive dynamic stability. All other combinations will not return to equilibrium and therefore are unstable. In aircraft, we discussed it as stability versus maneuverability. Maneuverability is the ease at which an aircraft moves out of equilibrium, which causes easier turns, but is more difficult to control. Less stable but not necessarily unstable. Versus stability is the tendency of an airplane to remain in equilibrium. Very easy to control, however difficult to maneuver. Increasing an airplane's maneuverability. If you wish to make an airplane more maneuverable with out affecting the airplane's overall stability, then you must increase the size of the control surfaces. Increasing the size of the surfaces increases the force that those surfaces are able to impose while not changing any of the stable or unstable tendencies of that aircraft. Or you can decrease the airplane's stability. Assessing airplane stability by axis. When we talk about stability of an axis, what makes the axis stable? The axis must have the ability to return to equilibrium when disturbed from it. Each axis has positive and negative contributions to this axis stability. Each axis is required to be stable overall for the airplane to be stable. Longitudinal static stability. Longitudinal static stability is the stability of the longitudinal axis around the lateral axis, or in other words, the stability or resistance to motion called pitch. Balancing moments around the center of gravity provides stability. Note, the CG aerodynamic center and lift and weight vectors. Depending on where the aerodynamic center is in relation to the center of gravity, it can cause a stable or unstable pitching moment. 
if the center of gravity is forward of the aerodynamic center as pictured to the right, any change in relative wind will realign that airfoil into the relative wind. Conversely, if the aerodynamic center is ahead of the center of gravity, any change in relative wind will cause a divergent trend of that airfoil away from equilibrium. All components of the airplane can be looked at as to where the center of gravity is in relation to the aerodynamic center. If the center of gravity is ahead of the aerodynamic center, it will be a positive contributor to that stability. If the, aerodynamic center, if the aerodynamic center is ahead of the center of gravity, it will be a negative contributor. Contri contributions to longitudinal stability are straight wings, swept wings or delta, fuselage, horizontal stabilizer, and neutral point location. Straight wings. Typical wings have an aerodynamic center ahead of the center of gravity. Straight wings are therefore a negative contributor to longitudinal static stability. Wing sweep allows the aerodynamic center to get closer to the center of gravity overall decreasing the moment arm of the aerodynamic center on the center of gravity. Due to this decrease in moment arm, swept wings or delta wings are looked at as a positive contributor to longitudinal static stability. Fuselage, normally destabilizing because its aerodynamic center is forward of the airplane's center of gravity. Horizontal stabilizer. The horizontal stabilizer is the greatest positive contributor to longitudinal static stability. Because of its relatively long moment arm, it is able to overcome all of the previous negative contributors to static stability. An airplane's neutral point is the average aerodynamic center for the overall airplane. Neutral point is usually a fixed point on the airplane as most wings do not move and most airplanes do not transform their figure. Conversely, the center of gravity can move when fuel is shifted, when ordnance is dropped, and when cargo moves inside of the aircraft. Weight and balance. Longitudinal static stability from the airplane is determined by the position of the CG relative to the neutral point. If the CG is forward of the neutral point, positive longitudinal, positive longitudinal static stability exists. If the CG is aft of the neutral point, negative longitudinal static stability exists. A weight and balance must be conducted prior to every flight. The position of the CG in relation to the mean aerodynamic core determines the weight and balance of that aircraft. Complex formula to derive the CG in inches aft of the leading edge mean aerodynamic cord or percent of the mean aerodynamic cord are used to determine the stability of the aircraft. As a rule of thumb, if the CG is too far aft, there will not be enough elevator authority to maintain level flight. The airplane will want to continue to pitch up and eventually stall. Conversely, if the CG is too far forward, the opposite happens. The following video is what happens when shifting cargo is allowed to be inside of an aircraft.
airplane tech takes the cat shot, all cargo shifted directly to the back of the aircraft, causing the CG to be too far aft. The airplane continues to climb until it stalls. At the stall point, the pilot forces the nose over to cause the airplane to get speed on. Unfortunately, the object rolls all the way forward, causing the CG to be too far forward and the nose too heavy for the airplane to be recovered. T6 natal limits put the forward limit of the CG at 165.5 inches aft of the firewall. The aft limit is 169.3 inches aft of the firewall. As you can see, there is a very finite place that the CG has to fall within for the airplane to remain stable. Fortunately, there is not a lot of shift of center of gravity in the aircraft, as neither occupant will shift. The center of gravity is directly over top of the fuel tank, so draining fuel will, and burning fuel will not shift. And the baggage compartment is fairly compact. Weight limitations, maximum ramp weight prior to takeoff is 6950 pounds. Maximum takeoff weight is 6,900 pounds, and maximum zero fuel weight is 5,850 pounds. Here's a helpful reminder as to the contributions to longitudinal static stability. understand longitudinal static stability, let's understand directional static stability. Stability of the longitudinal axis around the vertical axis is directional stability. The resistance to the motion called yaw is also that directional stability. As a plane encounters a side slip angle which is the angle between the longitudinal axis and the relative wind, that side slip will cause an airplane to either yaw into that new side slip or yaw away from that new side slip. Contributors to directional static stability are straight wings, swept wings, fuselage, and vertical stabilizer. Since straight wings are symmetrical on either side, a side slip will cause the wing on the side of that new side slip to be the advancing wing and the side away from that side slip to be the retreating blade. The advancing wing will have a higher velocity of airflow over it causing an increase in parasite drag, dragging that wing back into the direction of that new side slip in relative wind. Conversely, the downwind wing will have less velocity over it, allowing, uh, causing less drag, allowing it to advance into that new relative wind. Overall, straight wings are a positive contributor to directional stability. Swept wings have the same increase and decrease in parasite drag. However, with it being a swept wing, not only is it a parasite drag conversation, it is also an induced drag conversation. The advancing wing will have increased cordwise airflow, causing more lift. More lift causes more induced drag on top of more parasite drag which will cause that wing to drag back and bring the nose into that new relative wind. Conversely, the other wing will have more spanwise flow, less lift, less drag, causing that wing to want to advance into that new relative wind. 
The fuselage is a symmetric airfoil with, an, with its aerodynamic center forward of the center of gravity. When the airplane enters a side slip, an angle of attack is created, creating lift and pulling the nose away from the relative wind. Thusly, the fuselage is a negative contributor to directional static stability. Vertical stabilizer is the greatest contribution to directional static stability. A side slip creates an angle of attack on the vertical stabilizer, which creates horizontal lift. The lifting force and long moment arm moves the nose back into the relative wind. Here's a helpful chart that will remind you what are the positive, negative, and greatest positive contributors to directional static stability. Lateral static stability. Lateral static stability is the stability of the lateral axis around the longitudinal axis. Resistance to the roll motion is lateral static stability. After an airplane is disturbed laterally, the airplane reduces bank angle and returns to wings level if the airplane has positive lateral static stability. Lateral side slip. During a lateral side slip, total lift remains constant. In the turn, the airplane descends since there is not enough lift to counter weight. The horizontal component of lift pulls the airplane in the direction of the bank, creating a side slip relative wind. We will look at the following contributors to lateral static stability. Dihedral wings, anhedral wings, high mounted wings, low mounted wings, swept wings, and vertical stabilizer. Dihedral wings. Due to the rolling motion in a lateral side slip, there is a downgoing wing and an upgoing wing. The downgoing wing has a roll induced relative wind from below the wing, which causes an increase in angle of attack. This increase in angle of attack causes an increase in lift. Conversely, on the upgoing wing, there is a roll induced relative wind from above the wing, causing a decrease in angle of attack. This decrease in angle of attack causes a decrease in lift. The rolling moment stabilizes the airplane in the upright position. Wing dihedral is the greatest positive contributor to lateral static stability. Conversely, anhedral wings slope in the opposite direction. This creates a destabilizing moment as the upgoing wing produces more lift because of greater angle of attack. The upgoing wing will continue going up, causing the airplane to be unstable in the lateral channel. Anhedral wings are the greatest negative contributor to lateral static stability. High mounted wings. When a high mounted wing aircraft encounters a lateral side slip, the fuselage impedes the airflow at the wing root of the downgoing wing. This increases upwash, which increases angle of attack, thereby increases overall lift on the downgoing wing. The upwash encountered on the downgoing wing crosses over the top of the fuselage and becomes downwash on the upgoing wing. This downwash decreases lift on that upgoing wing, which causes an imbalance that creates a stabilizing moment and rolls the wings back level. Conversely, low mounted wings, the fuselage partially blocks airflow going over, up and over the wing root, 
which causes lift to decrease on the downgoing wing and causes it to increase on the upgoing wing. Destabling, a destabilizing moment is created. Swept wings or delta wings. The swept wing that is downgoing has more cordwise flow and a lateral side slip causing more lift causing it to want to come back up conversely the upgoing wing has more spin wise flow decreasing its lift overall causing an increase in lateral stability vertical stabilizer during a side slip AOA on the vertical stabilizer increases Therefore, lift increases on the vertical stabilizer. Since the vertical stabilizer is above the center of lift, this will cause not only a yaw in the direction of the new relative wing, but also a roll back to level, making it a positive contributor to lateral static stability. Here's a good memory aid for contributors to lateral static stability. Now that we understand static stability in the various channels of lateral, directional, and longitudinal, we can understand how those axes or stabilities interact with each other to cause dynamic effects. Lateral and directional stability are interrelated, which we call cross-coupling. A yaw will cause a roll, and a roll will cause a yaw. Directional divergence is a result of negative directional stability, most often caused by some sort of airframe damage. This occurs as a response to an initial small side slip, which then results in an increased side slip as the airplane has negative directional stability and continues to slip away from the relative wind. The airplane continues to yaw, increasing the side slip angle further, then experiences full directional divergence caused by the negative directional static stability. Eventually, the airplane will become uncontrollable Spiral divergence is caused by an aircraft that has strong directional static stability but weak lateral static stability. A plane that has this is the EA-6B Harrier. A yaw and roll will happen in the same direction as the side slip. Since the airplane has weak lateral stability, the airplane will continue to roll in the direction of that side slip. Due to the strong directional stability, the airplane will remain in control. Pilot control is required to get a plane out of spiral divergence. Dutch roll is found in aircraft possess possessing strong lateral stability and weak directional stability. Due to this strong lateral and weak directional stability, the nose of the airplane will scribe a figure 8 in the sky. As the nose deflects away from the relative wind, the lateral stability will cause the wings to become level and the advancing wing will retract away from that relative wind, pulling the nose back towards the relative wind. Since there is weak directional stability, the nose will not stay in the relative wind. It will continue on to the other side, where the opposite wing will now be drugged back. 
causing that figure eight to be scribed in the sky. Fugoid oscillations are long period oscillations from 20 to 100 seconds of altitude and airspeed caused by an upward gust. As the plane climbs and gains altitude, it will lose airspeed, maintaining a constant angle of attack. Corrections are transparent to the pilot as the plane gradually makes its way back to equilibrium. Proverse roll. Proverse roll is the tendency of an airplane to roll in the same direction as it yaws. The pilot yaws the aircraft, and the aircraft will roll in the same direction. This is caused by the pilot forcing a wing to be advancing and the other wing to be retreating. In a yaw to the left, a forced yaw to the left, the right wing will advance, causing more relative wind over that wing, causing more lift from that wing. Conversely, the left wing will be retreating from the relative wind, causing less velocity and less lift. Thus, there will be an imbalance in lift, causing the airplane to roll to the same direction as the yaw input. Adverse yaw is the opposite function. This is the tendency of an airplane to yaw away from the direction of aileron input. As aileron is deflected in the sense of a left wing roll, the right aileron will be deflected down, increasing the camber of the right wing increasing the lift, and also increasing the induced drag. Conversely, on the left wing, the aileron will be positioned up, decreasing the camber, decreasing the lift, and thereby decreasing the induced drag. This will cause a yaw in the opposite direction of a roll input. Adverse yaw is most commonly found when making turns in an aircraft. It is the most common cause of an airplane getting into a slipped turn. Pilot-induced oscillations are short period oscillations of altitude and AOA. This occurs when a pilot and the airplane's inherent inherent stability attempt to return an airplane to equilibrium at the same time. During a fugoid oscillation, if the plane climbs a little bit, it would have started to return down on its own, but an overeager pilot will shove the nose down, causing that airplane to over-descend through, picking up airspeed and causing more drag. This will then cause the nose to come up, but since the airplane was below its altitude, the pilot will also pull the nose back, causing the airplane to shoot back through the altitude going up now. This is also caused called porpoising. Asymmetric thrust. An airplane will yaw towards a dead engine. The magnitude depends on the thrust imbalance and the distance of the engine from the airplane's center of gravity. Rudder deflection is necessary to compens compensate. As is seen in this video, the left engine dies during takeoff causing the airplane to yaw to the left.
displacement from the center of gravity of that aircraft can cause a yaw which can be unrecoverable. In summary, we looked at takeoff, cruise, and landing performances, and all of the profiles. We looked at the propeller and some troubles that are found when you have a propeller for a propulsion system. We talked about turns and turn performance, load factors, and stability.